back at it again, baby. And we got another one with the brother Thomas Soul. Let's dive in. Southern whites were as different from northern whites when it came to sexual patterns as they were in other ways. Widespread casual sex was commented on by outside observers in both the American South and in those parts of Britain from which Southerners had come. Shotgun Pete's. Um, here again. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. It's got Shotgun Pete's on the, on the roof and then Wedding Chapel on the front. So it's a gun store and a wedding. Oh, my goodness. Sheesh. Again, the greatest contrast is with New England. While pregnant brides were very rare in 17th century New England, they were more common in the southern backcountry than anywhere else in the United States. A missionary estimated that more than nine-tenths of the backcountry women at whose weddings he officiated were already pregnant. In this, as in other respects, the sexual customs of the southern backcountry were similar to those of northwestern England. Meanwhile, the region of England from which New Englanders came had the lowest rates of illegitimacy in England, just as their descendants had the lowest rates of illegitimacy in the United States. Women dressed more revealingly in the South, and both sexes spoke more freely about sex than was common in New England. In the 17th century, most Virginia girls found a husband by the age of 17, while in Massachusetts, the average age at which women married was 23. In that era, fornication and rape were acts severely punished in New England. Rape was a hanging offense in New England, while in the Chesapeake Bay colonies, it was sometimes punished less severely than petty theft. As with other North-South differences, differences in sexual behavior have often been attributed to the existence of slavery in the South due in this case to the opportunities which this presented for sexual exploitation of slave women. But again, history shows the same patterns among the same people and their ancestors in Britain before they had ever seen a black woman. In colonial Virginia as well, the sexual exploitation of white indentured servant girls was common before the slave population had grown large enough for white servant girls to be replaced by black women. Mm, so they they were even doing that to the the white servant people. I, I don't want to say that word, but I know he said it. But um, YouTube is a little weird about some words. So I, I, the the R word. So yeah, that's very very interesting. Didn't know that. Religious denominations, practices, and churches differed as between the crackers and rednecks of the South and those of the white population in the rest of the country, as in other things. The greatest contrast was with the role of religion in New England. This did not mean that there was uniformity across the South, for the Virginia elite tended to be Anglicans, and there were also Quakers in the South, for example. But most Southerners were either Baptists or Methodists. Those Northerners or foreigners who visited the South found the style and manner of religion among most white Southerners distinct and distasteful. These visitors viewed with contempt people who whooped and hollered, chewed and spit tobacco in church. Many Southern religious gatherings were not held in churches, but at outdoor camp meetings, a style that went back to practices of these Southerners' ancestors in Britain. Mm. So too did the oratorical style of Southern preachers and the behavior of their congregations, whether in churches or outdoors. Frederick Law Olmsted's description of a typical preacher in the antebellum South noted that the speaker nearly all the time cried aloud at the utmost stretch of his voice, as if calling to someone a long distance off, that he was gifted with a strong imagination and possessed of a good deal of dramatic power, that he had the habit of frequently repeating a phrase, and that he exhibited a dramatic talent that included leaning far over the desk with his arms stretched forward, gesticulating violently, yelling at the highest key, and catching his breath with an effort. Similar scenes were described a century earlier in Virginia, and at a camp meeting in Scotland, where the preacher was sweating, bawling, jumping, and beating the desk. This melodramatic and emo- Sounds familiar. Sounds real familiar. This is all interesting to learn about, like, I, I had no clue about any of this until I started checking out Thomas. This is crazy. Emotional oratorical style could still be seen in 20th century America, not only in religious services, but also in politics, 
both among white Southern politicians of the Jim Crow era and among black leaders of the civil rights movement in the South and community activists in the Northern ghettos. By contrast, religious services in colonial Massachusetts developed what has been called the meeting and lecture approach, where the style of preaching was a relentless cultivation of the plain style. These addresses tended to be closely argued statements of great density, in which Puritans reasoned as relentlessly with their maker as they did with one another. This intellectual approach to religion carried over into their daily lives. Even more than most people in their time, they searched constantly for clues to God's purposes in the world. It was this impulse which led so many English Puritans to study nature with that extraordinary intensity which played a central part in the birth of modern science. There was a dark side to this intensity as well. The vast majority of the persecutions and executions of women for witchcraft occurred in New England. Quakers did not have the persecuting intolerance of the Puritans, but they too had plain spoken religious meetings, also in con That's crazy to think about. Like there were some individuals just accused of being a witch and killed. What what does that even mean? You're a witch. <laughs> Sheesh. I wonder what you know, a hundred, two hundred years from now, people will look back on today's time and be like, well, why were they doing that? Let me know. Contrast to melodramatic services among the rednecks and crackers of the South. The Anglican services were likewise less emotional and dramatic, but Anglicanism in the South was largely confined to the Tidewater region. Catholics, too, had a quieter service, though more formal than the Quakers, but there was little Catholicism in the South, where even Irish immigrants tended to become absorbed into the Protestant religions, just as the Scots tended to become absorbed into Southern fundamentalist religions. The South was a region lacking the prerequisites for maintaining an educated clergy, as required by both Presbyterians and Catholics. Anyone familiar with religious practices among black Americans today will recognize the clear imprint of the white Southern pattern. It was not just, like I said, it definitely sounds familiar. That is for sure. Recognize the clear imprint of the white Southern pattern. It was not just the Southern preachers who behaved differently from their counterparts in other parts of the country. So did the congregations. While many of those listening to hellfire and damnation sermons were moved to extreme emotional reactions of fear, confession, and repentance, many others took these sermons as dramatic performances or spectacles and the young women and men often treated these religious gatherings as occasions for socializing and preludes to romantic encounters later. This pattern, too, went back to earlier centuries in Scotland where, while some at the camp meetings were groaning, sighing, and weeping for their sins, there was usually also a knot of young fellows and girls making assignations to go home together in the evening or to meet in some alehouse. While the keeping of the Sabbath as a day free of worldly activities and amusements was a common practice in many parts of the United States in centuries past, that was not the practice among the rednecks and crackers of the antebellum South. Southerners had fun on Sundays, to the consternation of Northern observers. One of the strangest sights to a New England man on visiting Southern states is the desecration of the Sabbath, wrote a Yankee. In some of the cities, especially if a good number of the businessmen are from the north, the churches are tolerably well attended, there being but one sermon for the day. But even here, the afternoon and evening are much devoted to amusements. Another northerner declared that in the south, there is no Sabbath. They work, run, swear, and drink here on Sundays, just as they do on any other day of the week. Many southerners did not go to church at all, or did so intermittently or when not distracted by other activities. Again, this was a pattern found among their ancestors in Britain. Among the reasons given by contemporaries for low church attendance among Southerners was that they often got drunk on Saturday night and were in no condition to go to church on Sunday morning. <laughs> got a little too drunk Saturday night, couldn't get up, was a little hungover. Hey. Make sure you hydrate before you go to sleep at night if you've been drinking. All right. Drink lots and lots of fluids. Lots and lots of fluids. A whole lot more, more than you normally would drink. It, hey, 
it helps. I'm not saying that I know from experience or anything. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying it helps. All right. Um, like I said earlier, though, it's really interesting to learn about all this because one, I was never taught this in school. I was never taught this outside, or two, I was never taught this outside of school. I had no clue about any of this stuff, not even a little bit, zero clue, zero. So this is all really cool to learn about. And as, as I'm listening to it, like I'm recognizing like, oh yeah, okay. That definitely sounds familiar. I, 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 I see that today. Oh, hmm. I just watched that. Okay. That makes sense. You know, like all these things that he's describing from the, 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 the Southerners, I'm like, wait a minute. Whoa. You know, it's like always, it's, it's, it's all familiar. And it's just like, oh, okay. That's crazy. But, um, yeah, that's, that's wild, wild to, to think about and to learn. But like I said before, that's, that's what life is about learning and growing every single day. And, um, through Thomas Soul's videos and these other videos that you guys have been sending me, that is exactly what we've all been doing, is learning and growing every single day. New information on a daily basis. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. But as always, you guys let me know what you thought about it in the comment section below. Like, share, comment, and of course, hit that subscribe button before you go. Peace and love. I'm out.